If you ask the people who know me best to say one thing about me, or even people who just passed me on the street or were stuck in a lift with me for five hours, they will certainly say the same thing. I really, really, REALLY like My Hero Academia. And at times, it's really difficult to explain why. Because it isn't just a single thing, like its animation or how it subverts your expectations. As well as the fact that MHA is, by all accounts, a straightforward and simple story that relishes in the many tropes of the genre. So my reasons tend to boil down to the simple things. I like it because it's optimistic, it's fun, it's emotional. And the reasons for those are usually because of lots of little things that are hard to explain. And the best way I've been able to convey why I love it is by watching other shonen and seeing what they don't do. Black Clover and Demon Slayer are the main ones I watch and think to myself, My Hero Academia did it better, like the petty man-child that I am. But then I came across what I believe is the perfect series to compare MHA to, in order to communicate these little things it does really well. This series is a perfect example of what tropes and components Kohei Horikoshi built on and refined in MHA. That series is Barrage, by Kohei Horikoshi. Published in 2012, this was Horikoshi's second manga to be serialized in Weekly Shonen Jump, which ran for only 16 chapters. But despite its short run, there is a great significance to it. Anyone who's looked into Horikoshi or MHA's conception knows that it's a story he wrote after he fell into a deep depression after Barrage got cancelled, which nearly caused him to give up on making manga altogether. But deciding to give it one last shot, he made a series simply of things that made him happy and that he'd have fun drawing. So I'd like to look into Barrage to see what caused it to be the ash pile that MHA would rise from, like a phoenix made of hope and really weird shipping. So welcome to Curmudgeon Media, I'm Ed, and today I'll be looking into how My Hero Academia improved on Barrage. Barrage takes place on the planet of Industria, which has been at war with invading aliens for 50 years, and focuses on an orphaned boy called Astro, who spends his days scavenging and labouring to provide for his found family of fellow orphans, until one day he's mistaken for Barrage, the Prince of Industria, and ends up taking his place. From here he has to learn the responsibilities of being royalty, and alongside the royal guard Tiamat, who definitely isn't just a razor head with a healthy sleep schedule, travels across Industria to fight the aliens. It's wacky, it's well drawn, and it's not very good. Yeah, sadly, if you read Barrage hoping to view Horikoshi as some misunderstood genius who wasn't appreciated in his own time, then I'm sorry to say that Barrage will not do that for you. It's not terrible, it's got a sense of fun to it, but it's pretty clear why it lasted as long as it did. Funnily enough, Barrage reminds me less of MHA and more of Black Clover, a world centred around monarchy, the main character is an orphan who shouts a lot, whose name begins with AST, which I found interesting, among other things, and the main similarity being that it misses the spice that made MHA so good, most notably in the very beginning. The first chapters of Barrage and MHA are actually quite similar in terms of general structure, being nearly the same length, so you have the chapter's plot beats happening around the same time, but the three areas where we can see MHA improve on Barrage are the main character, the chance encounter, and the climax. Astro's prime motivation is to provide for his family, which is something he constantly proclaims and is ready to fight anyone whenever they insult his family, or even the concept of families in general. It does to Astro what calling Marty McFly chicken does to him. And there are three problems with him as a protagonist. Problem one being that his love for family is his only character trait, and he'll let you know that. A lot. Like a real lot. And for this to really work, we would need to spend time with his family so that we feel the same way he does, allowing us to share in that sense of love and companionship. <laughs> problem two is that we barely see him with his family, meaning we don't really know who they are, which weirdly is also a problem it shares with Demon Slayer. It shows us a family that presumably means the world to the protagonist, but because we barely saw them interact or get acquainted with them, they mean nothing to us, which gives us a disconnect from the protagonist. It's implied that the fact that they're his family on its own is enough motivation for us to care, which makes them less characters and more plot devices. So that leaves us with just his core personality, which is pretty one note and never truly challenged, which leads to problem three, which is that he is incapable of internal growth. He has no personal obstacle to overcome. Nothing has to change about him internally, only his external circumstances. And the issue with this is that he doesn't have that immediately evident trait that he needs to develop. It feels very much like he would remain the same as he was at the beginning, but just maybe more competent. So while his circumstances change, he remains static because he doesn't have anything to overcome, because both his character and situation are optimal. Soon after he becomes a royal, he gets his family to move in with him, so his main goal is technically complete. And now the story isn't about growing, but about maintaining the status quo. And we'd see all three of these issues amended in Deku. For anyone watching this video completely blind, My Hero Academia takes place in a world where 80% of the world's population are born with a unique superpower, 
or quirk. And being a superhero is now a full-on profession that you can get educated for like any other job. And we follow Izuku Midoriya, aka Deku, as he works his way up from the very bottom to become the number one hero, and be like his lifelong idol, All Might. Deku does share a similarity with Astro in that he cares about one thing so much that he will never shut up about it. But there are several reasons why that works. The main one being that it fits with his character as a fanboy, who through years of note-taking has become a human encyclopedia for heroes. His love of heroes is his key trait, like Astro's love of family was for him, but Deku has parts of himself built on top of that. Because of his fanboy knowledge, he ends up being a really strong analytic and tactician, and it even causes him to pick up bad habits like muttering to himself. It's like the little additions to the core of his being. And we're more on board with this fascination of heroes because we've seen it. The opening scene is him rushing to get a glimpse of heroes in action, which is seen as this exciting, bombastic public theatre, with him constantly commentating and note-taking. And that's not even getting into All Might himself. We get a clear glimpse of what he means not just to the wider world, but to Deku specifically. It does a great job of making us want to be a part of this imaginative and fun world, and therefore we feel Deku's excitement. And as for character flaws, Deku has both an external and internal one. The external one being that he's one of the remaining people in the world to be born quirkless, or without a superpower, which I know is common in the genre. But it feels heavier because not only have we seen heroes in all their glory, but we've seen just how crushed Deku is when he's told he can't do it. Being a hero isn't just something he wants for other people, but something he wants for himself. Not being able to do that makes him miss out on such a key part of life, leaving him a victim to a life of mediocrity and ridicule. And in terms of internal flaws, this has led him to become incredibly timid and overly emotional, which makes him feel a bit more human. Which would make sense given the Horikoshi put more attributes of himself into Deku. Ultimately, I can only draw one who was similar to myself, so I took my social anxiety and tendency to overanalyze, sprinkled in some optimism, and ended up with Deku. His internal flaw is overcoming that self-doubt, and it's clear from the beginning that's what he has to learn and overcome in order to grow, which is what he does over the course of the story. It's actually pretty weird going back to the beginning of MHA to see Deku, knowing just how more competent and respected he gets further down the line. All these things make Deku hit that sweet spot between someone you relate to and someone you aspire to be like. Point is, the personal journey his character has to go on was clear from the get-go, especially considering All Might is there as the embodiment of what he needs to be. The journey from Deku to All Might is the whole point of the story, and that's immediately clear from the very beginning. Speaking of All Might... <laughs> Both Astro and Deku have a chance encounter with someone of significance to the world. That ends up being the key encounter that initiates the plot, and at similar points in the first chapter. In Barrage's case, Astro catches the attention of Prince Barrage, who approaches him noting their similar appearance, and he offers to trade places with him since he's sick of royal life and just wants to be a hedonistic prick. He puts a weird bangle on Astro's arm before loudly proclaiming his freedom, and then immediately got shot by a sniper. Several royal guards see Astro, mistake him for Barrage, and drag him back to the castle. Meanwhile, in MHA, on his way home from school, Deku gets attacked by a slime villain and is saved by All Might. But before All Might jumps away, Deku grabs onto his leg to ask him if it's possible for someone without a quirk to be a hero. Before we go into details of both, we can already see a key difference between these two scenarios. The first thing anyone learns in a writing class is the difference between active and passive protagonists. Your main character either seeks out the plot or has the plot happen to them. And while a passive protagonist can work in certain stories. For a shonen series, having an active protagonist is paramount, as it gives them more agency within the story. Everything in Astro's situation was completely out of his control. Prince Barrage approached him, gave him the bangle, someone else shot him, and the guards then took Astro away. He was basically an observer rather than a participant in the setup, effectively a prop in his own story. Whereas with Deku, while his chance encounter coincided with the villain that All Might was chasing, All Might saw no need to talk to him after he was saved. It is then Deku's decision to grab onto his leg, and even following that, All Might is even more dismissive of him, trying to get away as quickly as possible, only to stop when Deku takes another action, asking All Might his question. It's basic stuff, I know, but where this gets interesting in MHA is how these actions have knock-on effects on the rest of the chapter. The events in the second half of the chapter are directly caused by his action to grab onto All Might's leg. Because of that, he loses the bottle containing the sludge villain, who then gets free and captures Bakugo, Deku's childhood bully, while asking All Might his questions stalls him long enough to deplete his power and reveal his true form. So now, Bakugo Bakugo is in danger, and All Might has no power to save him, neither of which would have happened if it wasn't for Deku's actions. Which makes it profoundly sad when Deku sees this and realises it's his fault, which is true. And again, we can see a prototype version of this in Barrage, where it tries to frame the final conflict as Astro's fault. In the beginning, Astro tried to defend his boss from an alien, which ended with them dropping their wallet. Now, as Astro settles into the castle, that same alien rocks up with a massive f*** off cannon saying Astro stole his wallet. But again, this is something out of 
his control, that goes for conveniences rather than meaningful consequences of the plot. Whereas there are alternatives that would make the situation a lot more interesting. Let's say for example he actually had stolen it out of desperation for money to feed his family. Then it would have more weight to it because then it's a consequence of his action, which would lead to a more hard-hitting emotional response from Astro. But as it stands, it lacks that involvement on his part to make this scene really feel consequential. But in both cases, the stage is set for... <sighs> The alien commits what is considered the most heinous of acts in Barrage, which is to insult family, which awakens Astro's rage mode and makes him literally burst out of the window to fight him. The bangle on his arm transforms into a giant spear called the Org. And in one fell swoop, he takes out the alien and resolves the entire situation. And truth be told, there's not really much to analyse here, because it's rather self-explanatory what the issues are. The Org feels like it activates out of convenience and functions exactly as it should, which again gives Astro no clear learning curve or anything to develop, which makes it fall under the common shonen problem, where power takes precedence over character. Compare that to MHA, given everything we know about the situation and that Deku realises Bakugo is the one in trouble, which makes his burst of heroism so endearing because it's simultaneously him trying to save Bakugo, trying to amend for his mistake, and can even be seen as his subconscious last-ditch effort to be a hero, as if his body is going against rationality to do what Deku wished he could do. I mentioned this before in my video about their rivalry, where the fact that Deku is acting despite everything Bakugo did to him makes him seem all the more paragon. He's presented a situation where he has good reason to not be a hero. Firstly, he can't, and secondly, the one in danger is his bully. But another key detail about this is that Deku doesn't actually save him. Rather, his actions push All Might out of his depressive spiral to step in. He's punished for his actions by everyone around him, but only All Might knows the truth. And from this, All Might decides to bestow his power onto Deku, believing that even though he didn't succeed, Seed, he has more potential than anyone else to carry on his legacy. The main strength of an active protagonist pays off here, as while the problems were caused by him, the reward feels earned. And we can see the change in how these powers develop as well. In Chapter 11 of Barrage, Astro's Org develops into a new form, changing it from a spear to a sword gauntlet. As for why or even how it changes, I couldn't honestly tell you. It mainly feels like an upgrade for its own sake, without any rhyme or reason, or even utilising the Org's internal logic, or lack thereof. Whereas One for All initially has a caveat, where Deku's body is unable to handle the power without it hurting him, so he has to gradually learn how to control it, which utilises his fanboyisms to analyse and adapt. So with all this in mind, it's pretty easy to look at Barrage with the benefit of hindsight and simply point and laugh. But I'm honestly glad that it existed, because of what it teaches us about how we should view failure. The things that make My Hero Academia great could only have come about from someone who understood what didn't work the first time around, using that knowledge to make a series that's full of life, personality, and optimism in the face of adversity. Barrage may have been the series that put Horikoshi into a depression, but what emerged from it was a series that proves it can be overcome. And if anything, Barrage makes the themes of MHA a that much more prominent, as its very existence is living proof that failure is only permanent when you let it be. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and want to see more like it, leave a like and be sure to subscribe for future videos. And if you want to help us make more videos like this, we're also now on Ko-fi, where you can donate as little as $1 or more if you feel so inclined. And with that, I'll see you in the next one.